in just a moment once this gets going. All right, and we are just now streaming. Excellent, welcome to our YouTube presentation, our conversation about false messiahs in Judaism. This will give us a chance to take a look at uh, the, our past history, uh, going back uh, uh, indeed thousands of years. Uh, we will have a chance to meet a number of characters, some of whom you may have heard about, uh, some of whom you may not have, and uh, understand a little bit more about uh, how these people became uh, proclaimed as or self-proclaimed as messiahs. Uh, and so without further ado, let's get into our presentation for today. Tuesdays, TM Tuesdays at 2. Grateful to have everybody here with us uh, as we take a look at false messiahs in Judaism, Jewish false messiahs. These, again, are real historical figures, uh, and they come about at particular times, as we will see, and have a chance to reflect on that. So, uh, um, first, in order to understand our first candidate, uh, we have to go back to the Jewish revolts against Rome. There were actually three of them. Uh, these three Jewish revolts at different times uh, resulted in a variety of different uh, disasters or semi-disasters for the Jewish people. Again, we were at first with the story of the Maccabees. Uh, we were very happy to have the protection of Rome because our ancestors found themselves stuck between the uh, Ptolemy Empire in Egypt and the Seleucid Empire uh, in what is today Syria. And stuck in between these two competing empires, <clears throat> or mini empires, we needed uh, a little bit of uh, protection. And so it is the Maccabees uh, and the Hasmoneans who actually establish uh, diplomatic relations with this young upstart, uh, soon to be empire from Rome and with that garnished some protections. Well, Rome quickly realized the strategic advantage to that land bridge between Africa, Asia, and Europe, uh, and decided that this would be a, a great territory to, to have. And so Rome comes in uh, and begins to subjugate uh, the Judeans, as we were called then. So our first revolt uh, begins in 63, um, and it ends in 73 with the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, it ends in that the Jerusalem is destroyed in 70, but there's still pockets uh, of resistance that is finally quelled uh, by Rome in 73. Uh, Jews uh, work out a variety of uh, arrangements with Rome and basically move north. Uh, the territory of Judea had been conquered uh, by uh, Rome. And so Jews, Jews moved up into the Galilee, uh, up into the north, into the Golan, into those areas, and established a semi-autonomous uh, Jewish territory. Um, as the Roman Empire continues to expand, there is a second revolt, uh, just you know, about 40 years later. Um, and this one ended up with the matter of Lod, what is today where you find Ben Gurion Airport uh, is the city of Lod. Uh, there is where Pappas and Lulianus, uh, these are Jewish guys, uh, Judeans, um, who lead this revolt, and Rome punishes they and their followers by basically massacring the town from which they came. And then we come to the third revolt in 132 to 136. This is the last revolt uh, of the Jewish people uh, against Rome. And this one is taken on the name of the Bar Kokhba revolt. But, and, and Bar Kokhba is the figure we are going to take a look at uh, at first. So again, after the first revolt, uh, Jewish leaders have um, you know, reestablished relations with Rome. Uh, indeed, uh, Trajan actually, Emperor Trajan actually gives the Jews permission to rebuild the second temple, but not in Jerusalem. That led to the second revolt. Trajan is assassinated. Hadrian becomes the emperor. Uh, and he's fed up with these Judeans, these upstart Judeans, renames uh, Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina. Uh, and on the former 
Temple Mount of the uh, Jewish people. He erects a temple to Jupiter. Uh, needless to say, we are not particularly happy with that. Um, we are, you know, living semi-autonomously, you know, north of Jerusalem, north of Judea, the Judean uh, territory, and uh, things begin to foment and fester there. Indeed, we have coinage from this time, uh, where Hadrian here depicted on one side of the coin, uh, and, uh, you know, the replowing of the land. Uh, you can see there's like an oxen shape. Uh, something there. It's pulling a plow. Uh, you know, this was his, you know, reclaiming and renaming and plowing over the Judean connection to that particular part of the land. Well, that wasn't received very well by, by the former Judeans, uh, now living as Jews in, uh, you know, in the northern territories north of Jerusalem. Uh, in the city of Jerusalem itself, uh, there is a huge military camp that is set up, a temple for Venus. Uh, you've got a couple forums there as well, and you see the Temple Mount. But again, now that's been dedicated to Jupiter. Uh, Hadrian really wanted to erase any connection of the Jews to that particular spot because these previous two revolts have been incredibly expensive uh, for the Roman people. Uh, you know, if you figure 63 to 73, 10 years of a war against the Jews, that's a long time. And, you know, that's a heavy financial burden. Uh, and it's only about to get heavier. Enter Shimon Bar Kos, Kosiva or Kosbi or Kosba. Uh, the pronunciation of his name is uh, somewhat um, up in the air. He's a very charismatic, very intelligent, physically strong, and an observant Jew um, who positions himself as a ruthless military leader. He is convinced that, uh, you know, like the Maccabees before, that the Judeans, these Jews, will be able to kick Rome out, reclaim the temple, you know, it's been desecrated again. A temple for Jupiter has been built there. Um, and he is able, through uh, sometimes quite uh, cruel techniques, is able to gather an army of anywhere from 200 to 400,000 men. This is a large, this is a sizable army. He was also rather ruthless to those who thought that, you know, Rome is not so bad. Um, he severely punished and executed Jews who did not join his army. So he is, you know, he is, he is truly a military figure and sees this as a military contest between he, uh, in his attempts to reclaim Jerusalem for uh, Jewish rule. Um, and so this is how he conducts himself. It's rather interesting that he's going to become our first false messiah as we look at this. Um, in, uh, as the revolt gets started, as his revolt gets started, uh, quite surprisingly, he is succeeding. Uh, and indeed is, like the Maccabees before him, able to retake Jerusalem and much of the Judean territory. And there he establishes a totally independent Jewish state within Judea, within the territory of Judea, again, Think roughly, uh, you know, Jerusalem and south, you know, Jerusalem over, well, we'll see in a minute. Um, he, he takes the title of Nasi, uh, which means prince. Uh, this is a term that's going to come uh, to play in our Talmud. We have Judah Hanasi, who is the redactor of the Mishnah. He's known as Judah Hanasi, uh, Judah Hanasi Prince Judah, because he was able to bring together these diverse teachings uh, that enabled Judaism to grow and to evolve. Well, because he was able to do this, because he was able to, you know, reclaim much of the Judean territory, and more importantly, kick Rome out of these areas, and most importantly, out of Jerusalem. Well, one of our great rabbis, Rabbi Akiva, proclaims uh, Shimon uh, Bar Kospi, or Kosba, to be now the Messiah and gives him the names Shimon Bar Kochba, uh, son of the star, 
Kochba means star in, in Aramaic. Kochav is star in Hebrew. And so Rabbi Akiva is so taken with, uh, with Shimon and his successes that he sees the, you know, the, the, the coming fruition of you know, an end time. Again, things have been incredibly cruel under Rome during this period. Uh, from the year 70 to 132, uh, things are only getting worse with each successive uh, governor and each successive emperor of Rome. So many Jews are feeling that, you know, it is the end of the world as we know it. And so uh, the messianic visions and messianic fervor uh, of, you know, the previous generations is now translated, and here we have a guy who seems to be doing some of what the, um, uh, of the Jewish concept of Messiah is supposed to be. Number one, he has reestablished Jewish rule. Number two, uh, there is an independent state. We, we saw this uh, in, in the Muslim world when there was talk of a, of a caliphate and how the, um, the, the, the extreme zealots within Islam were seeing this as, you know, the coming of their time. Well, this is what it was like for uh, the Jews of this time, of Rabbi Akiva's time, that Bar Kokhba was able to do something that has not been able to be done before. Rome is now out, at least of Judea. Um, and so, um, um, Rabbi Akiva names, uh, renames Shimon Bar Kosba Kosiva. He renames him as Shimon Bar Kochba. And this is a play on a verse that is seen as being a telling of the coming of the Messiah. And that verse is from a prophecy of Balaam, the prophet who was hired by the Moabite king Balak to curse the children of Israel. And in one of the supposed curses, three times, uh, Balaam uh, is asked to curse the Israelites. Three times, Balaam says to the king Balak, I can only say that which Adonai tells me to say. Um, and three times, much less than a curse comes out. Uh, indeed, it is a blessing. And in one of those, Balaam says, I see him, I see Israel, but not now. I see him, but not near, meaning I see something from the future. Balaam was known as a seer whose predictions came true on numerous occasions. So he has, he has a reputation. There shall step forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite through the corners of Moab and break down all the sons of Seth. That prophecy of, um, of Balaam is understood now by Rabbi Akiba to be coming true, that there is a star that is stepping out from Jacob, Jacob being the people of Israel, uh, out of Israel, the land of Israel, and that star is none other than, than the Shimon Bar Kosba, who has reclaimed Jerusalem, kicked Rome out, the Messiah is here, and this is it. Um, we even have fragments of letters uh, where uh, Shimon Bar Kokhba writes letters of encouragement to Jews in other areas, uh, letting them know of things that are going on. Um, from Shibon ben Korsiba, this is his, his name, he's writing to Yeshua, Joshua ben Galgula, uh, and the men of Gadar Peace, I call heaven to my witness that I'm fed up with the Galileans that be with you every man, and I am resolved to put fetters on your feet just as I did to Ben Aflu. This is a, it's not from Kings 1, sorry, this is the translation of this uh, parchment. It is a letter of encouragement, but also a, a letter of, you know, a political force and military force. I am going to, you know, extend the, the you know, this Judean uh, independence to all of the lands. Coins were minted uh, at this time, uh, during the Bar Kokhba revolution. Again, this is the, the revolution goes on for, for several years, for four, three or four years. And during that time, well, you have to have commerce. And so coins are minted. Uh, this one depicts the temple facade 
uh, on the left-hand side. And again, the temple had been destroyed by Rome, but it's going to be in the process of being rebuilt. Uh, and on the flip side of that coin, uh, there is a lulav, uh, and the text reads, you know, freedom to Jerusalem. So Bar Kokhba was able to achieve one of the things that the uh, Jewish tradition taught would happen when the Messiah comes. Uh, another coin that was minted at this time uh, has a, you know, a, a bunch of grapes, as you see there, uh, surrounded by the name of Shimon. It's written in uh, pre-Hebrew letters. Some of the letters you can make out, there's the letter Shin, uh, there's the letter Ayin, um, and so some of the letters are the same letters we use today, but some are slightly different. And again, there's a palm branch with freedom for Jerusalem. Um, and then another minted coin from this area has, has trumpets. These are shofars uh, on one side of the coin. Um, and again, freedom to Jerusalem. And a lyre, a musical, you know, a kinor, uh, a, a stringed instrument, um, year two of the freedom of Israel. So these coins were minted in the second year after Bar Kokhba had led his troops to victory and kicked out uh, Rome out of Jerusalem and out of territories of Judea. So here you get an idea. This is now the area that is controlled by Bar Kokhba and by the Jews. Uh, it includes up here Jerusalem, uh, Jericho, uh, Betar, which is going to uh, become a very important place for uh, Bar Kokhba, as we will see. Uh, Hebron, the caves of Qumran are down here. Masada is down here. So this is, you know, this is now the territory of Judea that uh, Bar Kokhba has been able to reclaim and rededicate to, to Jewish independence, total independence. Wow. You know, this is the first step of the coming of the Messianic age. Well, perhaps. In response, <laughs> uh, Rome is not an empire to be messed with. Uh, and Hadrian, uh, in 134, sends 10 Roman legions, okay, with uh, uh, units from another 50 auxiliary units, um, <laughs> unites, <laughs> Isn't it nice to see spell check doesn't quite capture everything for us. Basically, a third of the Roman legion has now been sent to Judea. Um, and in the initial, uh, Roman losses are, are extreme. Bar Kokhba and his followers are indeed like the Maccabees. They are successful. Well, Rome is a large empire. And uh, it suddenly, you know, it doesn't take long for this to become a, a game of, uh, of attrition. Uh, you know, Bar Kokhba only has so many uh, men, and the Roman Empire can draw on its entirety, and it does so. So little by little, Rome begins to succeed. And it retakes uh, Beit Sha'an, and it takes the, retakes the Judean highlands. It takes uh, the city of Herodium, which is still in Israel today, um, retakes all of those places, including Jerusalem. Uh, Bar Kokhba has to retreat to his um, a fortress uh, in Betar, which is the last stand. In the summer of 135 CE, uh, this is when Bar Kokhba has retreated now. We have the 5th Macedonian and the 11th Claudian um, um, of the Roman legions are there attacking Betar. Betar finally falls, and by the spring of 136, there is no more Jewish rebellion uh, in the land of Judea against Rome. This lesson, by the way, is what is motivating our rabbis as, uh, as they set to work in the, both the Mishnah and the Talmud to retool Judaism. This hurt us. This hurt us desperately. Uh, the number killed is, uh, is, is excessive. Uh, indeed, um, many of the writings depict streets flowing with blood, uh, corpses laying unburied because there were no survivors. This was a, a, a brutal, brutal act on behalf of the Roman Empire, but that's because we rose up against it. 
and Rome is not going to let word of that stand and indeed is going to let the fear of what happens if you try to rebel against Rome carry its own weight. And so the Roman legions um, bring about a, a, a horrific sense of justice for Rome by slaughtering every Jew they find. That memory is still in the minds of our rabbis who are up in the north, who are up in Galilee. Um, as they are working on retooling Judaism, they know that we want to continue this fight against Rome. And they also know that if we do so, uh, Rome will slaughter us all and there will be no one left. So Bar Kokhba, our first Messiah, uh, dies in battle uh, in Betar uh, and thus ends the, um, uh, the, the speculation of uh, this Shimon Bar Kosbi, uh, Kosiva, Kosba, is, Bar Kokhba as he was known, now says that time is all over. Within the Talmud itself, there are speculations as to, you know, when the Messiah will come. And understand, this means the end of this world. In our own generations, we have uh, heard many from various religions, um, especially within some branches of Christianity, that have predicted the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus at various dates, uh, even in the last 50 years. So this end of time uh, eschatological speculation and the coming of the Messiah is something that is part of human nature wanting wanting this, the, the, the troubles and the trials and the difficulties of this physical life to end. And so within the Talmud, we have speculated dates, you know, that there's going to be, you know, 85 Jubilee cycles or 4,250 years, and this is when the Messiah is going to come. And what is the date? Elijah says, don't ask, don't worry about it, it'll come. Um, Rabbi Hanina says, it'll be 400 years after the destruction of the temple. Uh, and, you know, something's going to happen then, or after 4,231 years from the date of creation. What's the difference? Uh, anyway, so we have some of our own speculation within the Talmud that is going to come to play in later times. We probably haven't heard of Abu Isa, uh, Ishak ibn Yaqub, uh, uh, basically Isaac, the son of Jacob. Uh, he's born in the 8th century CE, uh, Persia. He's believed to be an illiterate tailor. Uh, and yet, a miracle happens, and he writes a book. Um, he is a very, again, another charismatic kind of person. Uh, he banned the eating of meat and wine during certain holiday celebrations. Uh, he's the founder of a whole movement within Judaism, the Issa White teachings, which um, you know, are, there, there's, there, there's, there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes teaches us. Um, and this is true with this. His teachings uh, have a little smattering of Judaism, a little smattering of Islam, and uh, it doesn't amount to much because he's not around for very long. Um, he, uh, legend has that, uh, you know, as the followers were beginning to uh, to buy into Abu Isa here as being the Messiah, uh, the the Ottoman Caliphate wanted to to attack, you know, to arrest him, to to put down, to to quiet this. Em emperors and empires don't like people talking about the Messiah. You know, they want everything to stay the same. They want people to go to work, pay their taxes, go home, go to bed, and do the same thing over and over again. Uh, they don't want people to think about their lives or think about the world being different because that doesn't bode well for the emperor or the empire. And so uh, the caliphate is going to attack. Uh, supposedly, legend has it, he drew it a, a line in the sand uh, with a, a palm branch and the caliphate was unable to defeat him. Um, however, uh, he does die uh, and he and his followers drift into the dust of history. Uh, we have another character, also from the 8th century, uh, but this time in Turkey. Uh, he's known by many different names. Uh, Shirini, Sharia, Serenus, Zenoria, Saura, Severus. Anyway, he's known by all of these names. Um, 
we have under the Ottoman Empire, uh, Omar II begins to um, restrict the liberties of the Jews and begins a campaign of uh, proselytizing and forced conversion to Islam. Uh, and so enter this character who is hostile to rabbinic laws. He does not accept the Talmud. Uh, he says that, you know, Judaism was too restricted by the rabbis. And as such, he begins uh, his own processes of reform. He overturns kashrut. Uh, he negates many of the traditional prayers. He uh, disbands the observance of the second day of the holidays, which at that time was a standard. If you were not in Israel, you had to observe two first days of the holidays, and in the case of Sukkot and Passover, two last days of those holidays, um, because you were living in exile. Um, he's quite a charismatic guy who has followers as far away as Spain who sent him money. Um, he's arrested by the Caliph Yazid II, uh, and as he is jailed, uh, he declares that, uh, that, that all of his incitement and all of his talk of, you know, being the Messiah and of, you know, leading Israel to their independence was all a joke. Uh, he is handed over to the Jewish communities uh, of Turkey, of the Ottoman Empire, to be punished, and we do not know what happens to him. He disappears from history. Uh, enter another guy in the 8th century. Why is the 8th century such a good time? Well, because it's, um, you know, it's, it's an appropriate time. There's been a lot of trials and tribulations against the Jewish people all this time. And so people are beginning to look for, you know, some sort of end to that and a reestablishment <clears throat> of the once great uh, Jewish empire, which ruled most of the land bridge, uh, today's Israel and uh, Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and parts of Iraq and parts of Turkey, Solomon's great empire. There's a longing to return to that. Enter Yudhan al-Hara'i, known as the shepherd. This is 8th century BCE in Persia, uh, you know, Iran, Iraq area. He happens to be a follower of Abu Isa, who we met <coughs> previously. He declares himself as a prophet, uh, you know, that he's receiving visions and messages from God, from Abu Isa and others, um, and other prophets, particularly Elijah has been speaking to Yudgan here. And so uh, his followers, again, <coughs> excuse me, we weren't so, um, we weren't so educated back then. We were, you know, peasant mentality. And so you've got a charismatic guy who's saying these things. We kind of went along with him. Many did. He opposed the uh, anthropomorphism within the Torah. You know, God has an ear, God has hands. He taught the doctrine of free will. And he also held that the Torah had an allegorical meaning in addition to its literal one, that we need to get into the text to understand what the real meaning of Torah is. He admonished his followers to lead an ascetic, an ascetic life, abstained from meat, um, and, and encouraged everybody to pray and to fast often, which was in keeping with Abu Isa. Um, he wasn't so big on the observance of Sabbath and festivals. They were, you know, more of a memorial. Um, and, um, and he seems to get a, a little bit of traction in history, but then he dies. But that's okay. His followers said he will return at a future date. Sound familiar? Ah, time again continues to pass. Again, lots of, um, uh, lots of our messiahs are going to come from, you know, the Ottoman Empire days or in those days, because the Ottoman Empire was sort of a transition from the uh, golden age uh, where Jews lived under Islam, maybe as second-class citizens, but we still lived uh, a greater independence. Uh, that golden age of Spain, um, which 
uh, begins around you know the ninth century and lasts until maybe the eleventh or the twelfth century. Uh, um, it is a time when we have Maimonides, we have Rabbi Moses ben Nachman, we have some of our greatest thinkers, our greatest uh, biblical interpreters, uh, Ibn Ezra, and so many others are coming from that time period. Well, as the Muslim empire finds itself under attack by the Christians uh, to reclaim some of those lands, um, anger is vented on the Jews, and little by little, uh, Jewish rights are taken away, Jewish independence are taken away, uh, things don't go well. Well, Menachem ben Solomon, uh, known as David al um, uh, leads a uh, begins a whole new transition. He is in the 12th century, again, still in Persia. He leads an uprising against the Sultan um, and is able to unite Jews from Baghdad, Mosul, Azerbaijan. Uh, he captures his own hometown. Uh, things seem to be going very well for him. He's a military leader. He wants to bring independence to uh, the Jews of this portion of, of Persia. He's brought before the Sultan. He claims to be the king of the Jews. He is able to escape his cell, which for his followers uh, only magnifies his uh, messianess. Uh, you know, he's he escaped, you know, from the Sultan's jails. Oh my goodness. Um, he confronts uh, the Sultan demanding, you know, freedom uh, for the Jews. Uh, he flees to his hometown and is uh, there murdered. <laughs> um, and that is the end of David al -Roy. His teachings are reported in Benjamin of Tudela, uh, about a hundred years before Marco Polo. Uh, travels to the east, Benjamin of Tudela had already done so. Indeed, Marco Polo follows many of Benjamin of Tudela's routes uh, and gets claim for it. Benjamin of Tudela was the first one. Everybody knows of Marco Polo. And so um, another one who again begins with uh, the idea of bringing Jews freedom, uh, released from this oppression, has initial successes, gains more supporters, uh, continues, and then ends up dying or being murdered. This is the theme of our Jewish false messiahs. Asher Lemlin, also known as Asher K. He's born in Germany. Uh, in 1502, he's in Venice. Um, and uh, there uh, he believes and, and teaches that Jews you know, need to, um, not yeshiva, goodness gracious, sorry. Jews need to practice teshuva and tzedakah, repentance, uh, and predicts that the Messiah would appear in six months and that a pillar of cloud and smoke will lead the Jews to Jerusalem, as was done when the Jews left Egypt. Again, we're talking the 15th, uh, 1500s, the 16th century. Time is very tough to be a Jew. Um, there's a lot of Christian uh, uh, open persecution of Jews, uh, of Judaism, uh, all of these things. And so Asher Lemlin, again, a, um, a charismatic speaker, uh, able to, to preach and draw people to him. He has followers from Italy, Germany, and indeed many Christians are now starting to catch on to this idea. Uh, in the 1500s, that this could be the coming of their Messiah as well, uh, Jesus, but here in the personage of Asher Lemlin. Uh, again, and he predicted that the Messiah would appear in six months. Again, that means the Messiah would appear. What happens after the Messiah appears? The world comes to an end. Well, after a year, <laughs> so six more months, and the Messiah has not come, uh, there's not only is there no Messiah, but there's no Lamlin either. He disappears, uh, which of course is probably a good thing because he predicted the Messiah would come and it hasn't. <clears throat> you would think with all of this experience that when we come to Shabtai Tzvi, that we would have learned our lesson. All right, these are, these are some of the greats of our false messiahs. Shabtai Tzvi, is the greatest of them all.
Shabtai Tzvi, as you see, we're in the 17th century. It's the 1600s. Um, we still have the Ottoman Empire in existence. Indeed, uh, Shabtai Tzvi is born in Smyrna uh, in Turkey. Uh, he's the son of Mordechai. He attended yeshiva, uh, mastered Torah and Talmud, but was disillusioned by the Talmud and instead became fascinated by the mysticism and the mystical teachings of Isaac Gloria and of the Zohar as well. And this is beginning to tap into a messianism fever, a messianic fever, a desire for an end of this physical world. The Zohar predicted that 1648 would be the time of the coming of the Messiah. And a number of Christian authors at this time had, predicting that, had predicted that 1666 would be the time of Jesus' coming. So there is messianic fervor going on, and I call it a fever because it is a fever, but it's also a fervor. Um, there's a messianic fervor going on and craziness going on in the Jewish community, 1648, and the Christian community, 1666. Ooh, maybe, you know, these sacred books and maybe these scholars have tapped into it. Again, just look back in the last 50 years um, when, uh, you know, various predictions of the second coming have come about. Certain Christian communities would get all terribly excited. Stay up all night. You know, Jesus is coming. Um, and here we are. You'd figured we'd learn the lesson. Well, Shabtai Tzvi finally teaches us the lesson because it's amazing what he's able to do to the Jewish community and the Christian community too. Sixteen forty-eight is a very bad year to be a Jew, uh, especially if you are in the Ukraine. Uh, the Khominsky massacre takes place. Uh, beginning in 1648. It is the Holocaust of Ukrainian and Polish Jewry at that time. According to Jewish records, 300 different communities were destroyed totally. Over 100,000 were murdered during the Kalminsky massacre. It begins the first major wave of emigration of Jews out of Europe, out of the pale, to anywhere else in the world. Well, in 1648, Shabtai Tzvi is 22 years old. And this pogrom, this massacre, uh, it's worse than a pogrom, this, this Holocaust um, is, is seen by many Jews as being an indication of the birth pains uh, of, of the Messiah that the world is going to give birth to the Messiah and there is going to be devastation and death and destruction uh, leading up to that birth. And so in 1648, with news of the Chalminsky massacre, um, Shabtai Tzvi proclaims himself as the Messiah and begins to pronounce God's name, the Tetragrammaton, as it is called, yud heh vav -He. he pronounces it as, we don't even know how it was pronounced because uh, it's not recorded for us, but Yahweh, Yahvah, however it was pronounced, he began pronouncing prayers with that name, which would have earned immediate uh, ire and rebuke from all of the Jewish leadership, but does not. He also claims that he could fly, uh, but he could not fly in public where uh, unworthy people would be able to see this miracle. All right, that's, that's not too bad. You know, why, why can't you fly now? Well, because in this crowd of people, there are sinners, and I cannot fly in front of sinners. Oh, okay. Um, well, the rabbis of Smyrna are not at all impressed with uh, Shabtai Tzvi. And they begin to think that he is, uh, you know, truly a bit mishuga, uh, And so they excommunicate Shabtai Tzvi. So Shabtai Tzvi flees to Salonika and holds a public event where he marries the Torah. And his excommunication from his hometown 
being rebuffed by his hometown leaders only furthers the image of he as a Messiah for his followers, because that's what's going to happen to the Messiah. You know, he's going to be denounced by those closest to him. Wow. Who closer than the rabbis who knew him? He flees to Salonika. He does this. He gets more followers now. And the rabbis of Salonika excommunicate him. You know, you're a troublemaker. Get out of here. He goes to Alexandria, Athens, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Cairo, all of these places he travels. He goes to Cairo first. There he befriends uh, a person who is a, a wealthy official with the Ottoman Empire, a Jew, uh, Raphael Joseph Halabi. Um, he's involved in the, in the finances of the Ottoman Empire in Cairo. He's in charge of taxes and other kinds of things. Shabtai Tzvi is a very charismatic man. Uh, description described him as a very handsome. He has a beautiful voice. He would sing. He would sing psalms all night and people would listen to his melodic voice. And he gains Halabi's support as the Messiah. Wow. Uh, he learns of an orphan, Sarah, who was orphaned during the Chominsky massacres. She was raised in a, uh, in a Catholic uh, orphanage where she is able to escape because um, they were trying to forcibly convert her. She was living as a prostitute in Livorno. Um, he hears of Sarah's plight uh, and um, following with the prophet Hosea, he sends messages to Sarah to come and join him in Cairo where they are married. The prophet Hosea, all of his his book, the book of Hosea in our Bible, is a description of Hosea who has married a, um, a, a, a promiscuous wife. He's married a harlot. Um, the analogy uh, for Hosea uh, and the teachings of Hosea, which come to us from the 7th century BCE, uh, is that Israel, by worshiping these other gods, is like the, this whoring wife. And Hosea is like God, who still wants to maintain a relationship with her because of his love of her. Well, because Sarah was this prostitute, what better image to capture? And so now, Shabtai Tzvi marries Sarah just as Hosea did in his stories. And this resounds throughout the Jewish world. This is an incredible, incredible thing. Many Jews are now starting to pay attention to Shabtai Tzvi. In 1663, he travels to Jerusalem. And on his way, he stops in Gaza. Um, he also stops in Aleppo. And if you, anyway, he stops in Gaza. Uh, and there uh, is a gentleman by the name of Nathan who meets Shabtai Tzvi and is so enamored with him and his teachings that Nathan says he is Elijah reincarnated. Because according to Jewish tradition, the Messiah is to be hailed, to be announced by none other than Elijah. Wow, okay. So now, Shabtai Tzvi now has his own private prophet who's running amongst the streets telling people of this great guy and all the wonderful things he's doing. He gets to Jerusalem, and there Shabtai Tzvi discovers that the Jews of Jerusalem have been heavily taxed by the Ottoman Empire. This was a common, common um, uh, occurrence, not only in the Ottoman Empire, but in Christian Europe as well. The Jews were engaged in finance, the king needed money, let's tax the Jews, great, here's my money, I'm all set. So the Jews of Jerusalem were heavily taxed by the Ottoman Empire for the privilege of living in Jerusalem uh, and uh, were unable, you know, they, they were struggling to meet this debt. Uh, and so what does Shabtai Tzvi do? He puts in a phone call to his buddy, uh, you know, Raphael Joseph Halabi back in Cairo, who's got lots of money. Can you, can you help us out here? And sure enough, Halabi does. And uh, to his followers now, he is the Messiah. He has relieved us of this incredible tax burden. The rabbis were not impressed. The rabbis of Jerusalem were not impressed. Uh, they 
they threaten to excommunicate him and his followers. What happens? Shabtai Tzvi flees back to Smyrna, back to his hometown, now with Nathan Ento and with many, many followers to boot. He returns in 1665, and on Rosh Hashanah of the year 5,426, there are shofars sounded in the synagogue in Smyrna, and the prayer is uttered, uh, proclaiming, Our Lord and King, His Majesty be exalted, namely Shabtai Tzvi, is now proclaimed as Lord and King. And Shabtai Tzvi proclaims that the Messianic age will begin next year, 5427 or 1666, in keeping, mind you, with the uh, Christian teaching at that time, because 1648 had already passed, so the Zohar was wrong. Now Shabtai Tzvi has a lot of power. He's got a lot of followers. He's got rich followers. He's got support from Jews all over the place. Italy, Germany, Netherlands, Europe, Asia. Um, it is a worldwide movement. Well, uh, at least an old worldwide movement. And um, there are many fanciful stories uh, being told now about Shabtai Tzvi. Again, this is in the days before press. You know, uh, imagine playing telephone uh, and you start a story in, you know, Jerusalem and by the time it reaches Paris, imagine how it has changed being transmitted orally. And so there are so many fanciful stories about Shabtai Tzvi and the things he's done, how he's been bitten by poisonous snakes and does not die, how he is able to heal the sick. There is a report of, uh, of a ship that appears off the, Scot off, the, off, the coast of, <laughs> off the coast of Scotland, and the sailors are all speaking Hebrew, and the sails are of silk, incredibly expensive, and the ship is waving the flag of the 12 tribes of Israel. The fever is now absolutely taking root in the hearts and in the minds of Jews and Christians throughout Europe and Asia uh, and, and the former Persia area, uh, and even North Africa. For instance, the Jews of Avignon, France, are beginning to sell their property, preparing to be taken to Israel. And they're selling the property at a loss because next year, 1666, this world ends. Um, he abolishes the fast of the 10th of Tevet, this date which commemorates the uh, initial seize of Nebuchadnezzar uh, on Jerusalem is a fast day. It is a sun-up, sundown fast. And he goes so far as to say that not only is this no longer a fast day, but it is going to be a, deep, be a day of merriment. He wants to do the same thing with Tisha B'Av, which is supposedly his birthday. Ugh. He ends up in Constantinople in 1666. It is not clear whether he has fled uh, uh, from Smyrna uh, or just ended up there. Um, but Nathan, his prophet, is telling people that Shabtai Tzvi is going to take the crown off the head of Sultan Mehmet IV, going to take the crown. Well, as soon as he gets to Constantinople, uh, you know, <clears throat> the Sultan isn't going to stand for that. So um, Shabtai Tzvi is imprisoned. And this only furthers the proof that he is the Messiah, because this is exactly what's going to happen. So money is sent to he and his followers. And so while in prison, he's able to bribe the guards and he's treated quite well. He gets moved to another state prison uh, where again, <clears throat> he is treated well. The followers are allowed to, you know, follow him and to sit outside the prison, you know, and to chant, you know, O Messiah, O Messiah. And so on Passover, what does he do? He violates the Talmud. Well, I'm sorry, not the Talmud, but he, he violates a later Jewish custom, which is that we no longer sacrifice and roast a lamb on Passover. Well, he does exactly that. Not only does he sacrifice the lamb and roast it, but he eats the forbidden fat. 
When you sacrifice your animal, the fatty parts are consumed on the altar. He instead eats it uh, as a sign of his divinity. You know, that portion of the fat was meant for God. And it was turned into smoke on the altar. And here he's eating it. The imagery to his followers is he is God. He is the Messiah. Everybody gets swept up in this. Jews and Christians alike throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa are now all swept up. There are even some Jews in Europe who are unroofing their homes. Unroofing their homes? Yes, they are tearing the roof off of their homes. Why? Because when the Messiah comes, our physical existence ends and our souls ascend, or our souls and our bodies ascend and travel to Jerusalem. In order to ascend, we gotta be able to get through the roof. This is how crazy this is. But people are believing this. Um, his initials are posted in many synagogues now. And the prayers in many Jewish houses of worship throughout Europe all include, bless our Lord and King, the holy and righteous Shantai Tzvi, the Messiah of the God of Israel. Wow! Could you get any more into it than that? And indeed, in many prayer books that are being printed now, there's a picture of Shabtai Tzvi alongside of King David. Now, we don't know what King David looked like, but um, the Messiah is supposed to be a descendant of King David. And so, um, he proclaims the 17th of Tammuz uh, and the 9th of Av, which again is his birthday, as a as a feast day and not a fast day. Uh, the 17th of Tammuz is when the walls are breached in Jerusalem. Uh, also, it is when Moses broke the tablets uh, when the children of Israel were um, uh, worshiping the golden calf. He has overturned those fast days now, uh, and he's even contemplating overturning Yom Kippur. After all, when the Messiah comes, there will be no more sins. Therefore, there's no need for Yom Kippur. He's contemplating all of those things. Well, in September 1666, this is going to be just before, you know, Yom Kippur. This is, you know, we are in the fall. Um, a group of Polish rabbis come to uh, Shabtai Tzvi and they request him that, that they accept uh, a wise man from their community, Nehemia who has likewise prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. And, uh, you know, uh, please receive him so that we can validate this. Meanwhile, in other parts of the Jewish and non-Jewish world, people are taking bets as to whether or not Shabtai Tzvi is the Messiah or not. Well, Nehemiah meets with Shabtai Tzvi and he's not convinced. He flees uh, Nehemiah uh, because he's not convinced Shabtai Tzvi's followers want to kill him. Nehemiah flees uh, to Constantinople. He uh, pretends to be an adherent of Islam so that he can meet with the Ottoman uh, Empire's officials. Uh, and he reveals Shabtai's plan, which is basically to, you know, overpower uh, the Sultan, uh, to bring an end to the Ottoman Empire, and to reestablish Jewish independence in the land of Israel, which is part of the Ottoman Empire at this time. Well, these plans are reported to the Sultan, and you can imagine what the Sultan does. And so Shabtai Tzvi is now transferred to another prison, uh, one without so many of his followers, one without so many guards that have been bribed. And there, <clears throat> the Sultan's vizier says, you have three choices. We have a trial of divinity that will prove that you are divine you will be impaled, or you will convert to Islam. What is the trial of divinity? The trial of divinity is that you will stand here in this, in this spot, and our archers will shoot arrows at you. And if you are indeed divine, the arrows will not pierce your flesh. So his choice is death by arrows, death by being impaled, or converting to Islam. Or if he truly believes he is the Messiah, surviving the trial of divinity, 
probably not surviving being impaled uh, or converting to Islam. And September 16th of the year 1666, Shabtai Tzvi, the self-proclaimed and now followed by both Jews and Christians as the Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi chose, you ready for it? He converts to Islam. The Sultan appoints Shabtai as his personal doorkeeper. He is later banished because he's still a charismatic figure and he still has a bunch of followers. And though he says, look, I was, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm talking with Jews because I want to lead them to Islam, um, he's banished. He dies in 1676 and there is no Messiah. But this leads us to our last guy who's not really a Messiah, um, although to his follower he's, he was. So basically what we have seen is that these are people who have truly a cult of personality, that they are providing their followers with the answers that they want to hear. What is it that the answers that the Jews want to hear? That our exile from the land of Israel is ended, that the persecution by whoever it is, is ended, <clears throat> that we will again achieve the state uh, the high state we once had uh, under Solomon back 3,000 years ago, um, and that all of that will take place. And so all of these people we've looked at have presented the Jews with exactly that. And in the end, none of it turned true. We turn to our last guy, Jacob Joseph Frank. He's born in Poland, <clears throat> and he claims to be the reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi and the biblical patriarch of Jacob. Um, but what Frank does is even worse. This is perhaps the first Jewish cult. Uh, and cult, I mean, from the standpoint of what we think of uh, the various cults that we've encountered uh, in modern times as well. He deifies himself and sees himself as part of the Trinity. Well, already we're getting an insight into where Jacob Joseph Frank is going, because what he does, <clears throat> and many of his teachings, is to try to combine various aspects of Christianity and bring that into Judaism. <clears throat> well, needless to say, he's excommunicated by the rabbis, but he becomes the founder of, of a Frankism, which is a, a, a form of almost nihilistic Judeo-Christianity. It's a very strange, strange religion that, you know, only exists because of, of the personality of Jacob Joseph Frank and able to bring together so many followers. He is, like Shabtai Tzvi, anti-Talmudic. Uh, the laws and the mitzvot of the rabbis are, are, are not uh, authentic Judaism. He adhered to an antinomianism practice, which is basically, we have to shatter all boundaries. You know, it's very nihilistic, it's very anarchistic, it's very uh, Nietzsche-esque, to say the least. Um, the mixing of holy and unholy together is virtuous. And so, orgies featured prominently in the Frankism religious expression. Because the only way to reveal tr the true God is through the destruction and the death of the social and the religious structures. Those were artificial structures built uh, by human beings in order to uh, control human beings and do not deal with the true nature of God. And so the only way to explore and, and encounter the true nature of God is to break all barriers and all boundaries uh, and all the rules. And in so doing, that is when you discover the true God. <clears throat> yeah, that's when you discover the Lord of the Flies, I think. But uh, Frankism is still around. Uh, there are Frankists still available for us. Uh, and you can find them, you can Google them online. So that is our look 
uh, at a variety of uh, the false messiahs that have appeared throughout time uh, in Judaism and uh, impacted the world in a variety of ways. From Bar Kokhba of the, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, the last, the last vestige of that uh, almost temple period Judaism to Shabtai Tzvi in the 1600s. Uh, it runs the gamut, but the core of all of these uh, people are the same that they were providing the Jews with the answers they were looking for to the times and the difficulties that they were facing. Uh, and in the face of either death or of some sort of uh, other type of punishment, we find these Jewish messiahs opting for conversion in Shabtai Tzvi case or just disappearance, uh, as in some of the others. So this has been a look at some of the false messiahs within Judaism. Any comments, thoughts, questions? Rabbi, I hate to get political, but it sort of harkens on what we're dealing with now with um, different camps of belief. And mm -hmm. in essence, wanting to find the answer to what is better. Absolutely, Sheila, you're absolutely correct. Uh, it is very much part of human nature. This is not only something that, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not only something that has happened in the past. Uh, this is something that keeps happening. We human beings would very much like an easy answer to all of our problems. Um, and throughout time, there have been those who have provided those answers. And yet we have also realized that that is our worst danger, that when we humans are willing to accept a simple solution to incredibly complex problems, that's when we are led astray. And for those who follow these false messiahs, uh, it is exactly uh, what happened. They thought these people were the real thing, that this was it, uh, that this was the end of the world, uh, and that these people had the ability to do all those kinds of things. And you would think that after having gone through so many of them, Shabtai Tzvi would not have been as big of a, um, uh, an experience within the Jewish world and the Christian world as he was. In part, maybe it goes to our gullibility. Mm -hmm. uh, in part, maybe it goes to our naivete. Um, in part, maybe it goes to our hope that this might be the change we need. Um, and so, yeah, these are people we find to this very day. Would you Others. say that uh, Jim Jones falls in that category, fell into that category? I would absolutely say that Jim Jones falls in that category. Um, even worse so because his followers literally drank the Kool-Aid, uh, you know, that they believed him so much that they were willing to die for him. Or forced to die for him. Anyway, mm -hmm. these are cults, you know, and a, you talk to someone who's in a cult, there's nothing you can say, there is nothing you can prove, there is no way to change their mind. And I think we're going through a lot of that in our country right now, which is extremely scary because of the violence. <clears throat> Absolutely. The violence that can come with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Nehemiah had to flee uh, after his encounter with um, Shabtai Tzvi because he didn't believe that Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah and, and Shabtai Tzvi's followers wanted to kill him. Uh, well, so Jewish people are vulnerable. You saw the guy in the T-shirt that says uh, Camp Auschwitz. So, yep. Plenty of them. We have Nazi <clears throat> arrests, so it's scary whenever there's upheaval in society. We're always the one to pick, they pick on. Well, the other thing is, Rabbi, I think you talked about this last time, the gullibility of Eve in the Garden of Eden when they were standing in the river, and she believed the serpent the second time, or am I thinking of a show that I watched on TV, because my days are kind of melding together. Anyway, the idea that Eve 
responded to the serpent the second time being gullible um, and getting out of the river instead of doing penance, uh, it goes, our gullibility, human gullibility goes all the way back to the beginning of Adam and Eve. Um, yeah, that was that was not with me. So I okay, think that sorry. was the beginning of the show. No, it's okay. Um, uh, without a doubt. Well, um, so there's a, a quote. You remember celestial seasoning tea boxes. They would always have a quote on the inside. And there's one quote that has stuck with me um, for decades. Uh, I read it on this box of celestial seasoning tea. Uh, and the quote is this. Um, it was Thomas Edison who said, um, five percent of the people think, ten percent of the people think they think, and eighty-five percent of people would rather die than think. And think. And therein lies our challenge. You know, uh, ignorance is bliss, and ignorance is blissful. Um, and if I, if there is something that troubles me. Uh, then I can either A, you know, uh, accept that and wrestle with that and understand that that is part of my history, or B, <laughs> deny that it happened. It never happened that way. Uh, you know, and so things that are um, too problematic for the human mind to comprehend uh, without investing a lot of thought energy behind, I can just dismiss that. Uh, as uh, fake news or as, uh, you know, as a falsehood or an exaggeration. Um, and so it is, it is scary when we think uh, that uh, how difficult it is for us to apply critical thinking skills, but that's exactly what we as human beings have to do. You know, my mother always said, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Probably is. Yeah. And so if you've got somebody saying they are the Messiah, uh, that they are going to fix all the problems, that uh, they are going to make everything new again, everything uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I'm wondering if the uh, Messiahs wanted money from the people and thereby getting rich. Hmm. That was certainly, yeah, thank you, Mary. And that was certainly part of it. Uh, the followers of Shabtai Tzvi uh, and some of these others did send money um, because uh, they believed in these people. Uh, they believed that they were who they said they were, and they wanted to support them in their mission, and their mission required money. You know, it takes money to bribe guards when you're in prison. So uh, Shabtai Tzvi was successful at doing that. Um, was he, you know, did he prove out to be the Messiah? Well, no, absolutely not. But, you know, that's something that goes on today as well with our televangelists and, and many others uh, who are happy to send money to a cause uh, that they think is worthwhile. I have a question. Yes, or, Joe. One, or actually two observations. One, it seems inter interesting there's a difference between a failed Messiah like Bar Kokhba, who I don't think saw himself as the Messiah and set himself up and was, you know, was false, but was proclaimed by somebody as renowned as Akiba to be the Messiah and fail. That which is so different than say the modern ones who are obvious charlatans. And speaking of the modern ones, uh, you didn't bring up the one who recently passed away in Israel. I think he was in Israel, uh, an Orthodox rabbi whose followers said he's the Messiah, oh. and they, they're waiting for him to come back. And I, I saw this um, on TV and I said, what? Yes, yes. yes. No, I, 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 um, it is not universally accepted within the Chabad movement uh, mm -hmm. that Rabbi Schneerson uh, is yeah. the Messiah. Um, yeah. Although there are some of his followers who have proclaimed him to be that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it is... It is uncertain whether or not uh, Bar Kokhba, you know, proclaimed himself uh, to be, but certainly saw himself as saving the Jewish people of his time. Uh, and he, you know, of all of the messiahs that we've encountered, the false messiahs we've encountered, he's the one who succeeded the most, uh, at least for a period of time. Uh, for a period of time, Jews were autonomous in the land of Judea. 
uh, the Temple Mount and uh, had, had full access to the Temple and the Temple Mount. Uh, and so for a brief period of time, excuse me, he may have been the most successful of our false messiahs. Uh, but he did fail in the end because Rome is not an empire to mess with. So thank you, Joe. Alrighty, folks, uh, this has been a great opportunity for us to explore um, an aspect of Judaism that uh, we, we, we kind of gloss over uh, and don't fully take into consideration the, the impact of, of these historic figures. Yeah, Peter? Yeah, uh, it just occurred to me that uh, the people who follow a Messiah, you know, people of that, uh, mental state are 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 also uh, people who don't want to take responsibility, but rather uh, you know give the, the responsibility for themselves to this other individual, uh, so they can just follow them, and uh, I, so I, I think there's you know, an even bigger impact in that type of personality than just following uh, a messiah. Excellent, an excellent insight. Um, you're absolutely correct because uh, when we consider the Jewish um, teachings about the messiah uh, is that, yeah, this is something that's going to happen to us. Um, and this person is indeed going to fix all of our problems because this person is going to end the world in which these problems exist. Uh, and so there, there is something very much true in that statement. It's not only a matter of thinking and critical thinking, it's also a matter of accepting responsibility, which we, you know, has been, you know, our human nature is, is, is often to duck our responsibilities or, or to pass that off. We're supposed to rise above that. We're supposed to acknowledge that that is, uh, you know, something that is part of being a human being, but we can be more than that. And, and we can accept our responsibility, which is why the reform movement speaks about a messianic age. It's no longer this single Messiah who's going to come and do this, but rather it's going to be people themselves who bring this about. Jews and Christians and Muslims and atheists and, you know, Buddhists and all peoples are finally going to realize that, you know, we, we only have this little blue ball in space to live on, that this is our home, that we are all related and we are all connected and we're, we're all connected to what's going to happen in this world. And therefore, we're going to end the fighting, we're going to end the hatred, we're going to end the bigotry. Uh, we ourselves are going, to, um, are going to transform ourselves. So there we have it, folks. This has been great. Um, next week, oh, any other last, last comments? Otherwise, uh, next week, question. yeah. Okay, um, maybe this is silly or not, but I rem whenever I hear like a Messiah is going to come, is it something that is a child that's been born and then through their life proof that they're going to be the Messiah? Or is it a full grown adult that just poof magically appears on earth? How is it, how is a Messiah going to appear in what way? Uh, so within, uh, within traditional Judaism, uh, well, uh, going back to the times of the Talmud, uh, it seems to be um, a, a, a full grown entity is going to appear, heralded by Elijah. And on the other hand, it's going to be someone who's going to be born around Passover um, and is going to be with us and going to become that individual. So we've got both extremes. Um, again, which is why I'm grateful to be part of the reform movement, because we no longer focus on the, the literal concept of a personal messiah. A, a, an individual who is going to appear, either being born and growing up with us or appearing, you know, um, suddenly in our existence, but rather this messianic age that we are going to bring about. 
but excellent question, Susan. It is hard to tell uh, what is, uh, you know, wh what is this person going to be, uh, because we do not have um, specific instructions about this in our scriptures, uh, and we only have um, uh, metaphors and, you know, uh, allegories in our commentaries and in our writings as to what's going to happen, because it is, in truth, all speculation. So thank you. Alrighty, folks, uh, we will uh, convene next week. Uh, and uh, if uh, email me some topics you would like to explore, otherwise we're going to turn our attention to some great Jewish thinkers. Uh, we're going to look at Baruch Spinoza uh, cool. from the 1600s and his impact on modern life. Uh, we will look at Sadia Gaon, we will look at Moses Maimonides, we will be exploring some of our great Jewish thinkers uh, in our future sessions. I wish everyone, please stay safe. Uh, remember, we are still in the midst of this pandemic. It is a pandemic. Uh, people are getting sick. Healthy people are suddenly finding themselves at death's doorstep. This is still a very serious thing. Be safe, wear your masks, wash your hands, and I will see you all next week. Bye, Rabbi. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Bye, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.